Okie dokie, everybody. We are live with class number 20 for Social 19. Uh, we'll go ahead and unmute Sam. Sam, how you doing, boss? I am doing well. I am back. Sounds good. And uh, back once again with the good doctor of dialogue, Lori Mulvey, um, who's here another time to keep us focused and grounded. And I think we'll have some very interesting uh, thoughts today about class. And let's put the first slide up, if you would, Jeff. Um, let's let me make a few announcements just as we get started. And the first one is that uh, the third quiz is next Tuesday evening through uh, or Wednesday morning. So it's you'll have um, it'll be open on Canvas, and you got to jump in. And you have to take the quiz, and the readings are as always online. Um, so. Um, Nothing changes except that you'll need to follow the, uh, I'll be sending an email out tomorrow about that. Um, secondly, the uh, survey, the reminder for the survey from Eric Silver is coming to you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So do that. That's worth four points. I said two, it's four. So I'm giving you an even, even bigger break because um, there are only 16 questions on the quiz instead of 20. And there's about an, an article that would take you about an hour to read and you don't have to read that. So awesome for that. So look out for the link. Secondly, um, the attendance quizzes after class. So some of you are not getting four out of five on these and you're saying, hey, I'm in class, I'm listening, I'm watching. Um, look, maybe you're paying more attention to the chat box than you are to the class. Um, it might be more entertaining, but uh, I, I'm not sure how we could make the questions easier, how we could make it easier. So if you have any ideas, pass them on to Lauren. Um, that would be nice. We'll think about them. But today's, if you're paying attention, you'll get the questions today. Um, last class, we shifted it from three out of five to four out of five in order to get full credit. Today, it's going to be four out of five because it's really, they're really easy. And uh, finally, the um, the the link for the World of Conversation Dialogues, the Zoom link, is in the 24-hour reminders that you're getting. Starting next week, it should be in the original. Um, the, um, the first email that you get as soon as you sign up. And by the way, Block 5 registration will start tomorrow at around 1 p.m. You'll get an email that seats are open and you can move forward on that. So. Um, let's, and those are the groups that start on Monday. So, Hey, by the way, um, don't miss groups. Y'all right. Like we, we really have a limited number of seats. And so, you know, we're going to have time to space to make some up. Um, but, uh, you, you really need to, at this point in time, not to miss groups. Okay. Um, and we're going to, and also you got an email about trying out for facilitator positions at world in conversation. So, um, take, take a look, is there anything you want to say on that? I, I want to say that a lot of times people don't think that they have the skills to be a facilitator or if someone hasn't invited them personally, maybe it's hard to know if, if that could be you. But what we look for is people that just have potential um, and are interested in group dynamics and communication and learning. Really, it's a learning experience. So if you have any interest, just do a tryout and, and there's, nothing, you, there's nothing to lose. And it's a group tryout. So you, you'll be working with a group of people. So just see yourself as having the ability to do it indeed uh we'll just keep sending emails till we get our team together so um hey so we have a a, a next slide jeff uh, our report from the field uh today is from bogota colombia it's uh our colleague from bogota renata rincon who is uh coming to us from her home where she is sequestered and isolated away. Uh, Renata, nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jeff, you go, You can start talking. Jeff will take care of your volume. Okay, okay, okay. It's because my, my headphones are a little bit damaged, but yeah, I'm from Bogota. Um, like many people in the world right now, inside the house, uh, for maybe now eight days, yeah, eight days. So one of the, so we were talking last night briefly and um, 
I think that some of the things that you were saying, I thought were really worth talking about uh, with the class about the actually what, the opposite of being inside, but it was what you were seeing outside your window. That was actually the part that was most intriguing. Yeah. Important, we thought to talk. about. Yeah. So he's, could you say what you're seeing? What's going on? I can show you a little bit, maybe. <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a street. It's not a street. I think it's a street, but we have like kind of river. It's not a river because it's not clean. And we have all the time people crossing in a normal life. We have all the time homeless and other people just walking uh, around here. And sometimes they sleep. There. What? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so you can see from my poverty, but not as we see it right now. Uh, if you go to the streets around the the neighborhood, uh, for sure somebody's going to ask you for money because we have lots of poverty, but we are in a middle class neighborhood. So, so we don't have lots of problems here in the streets. But uh, always there, there are people asking for money from Colombia and from Venezuela. Uh, and we have that problem. And these days have been differently because I can see from the window far away a shop, a big shop of, of uh, cheap items. It's not a supermarket, just a little one, but it's a um, chain of supermarkets uh, with uh, cheap products. Um, and I don't see a lot of people asking for money, like I see it uh, in other days. Um, today, it, w it was more people. I, I saw more people asking for money. In fact, just 10 minutes ago, I saw somebody with a stick asking for money to, to somebody else that was buying things at the shop and walking uh, to the house because everything is alone. And of course, there are only two in the street. The ones that go for for whatever food, or, and the others are people asking for money. So, so it's kind of dangerous for us because uh, people are hungry, are really hungry people that live in the street. So you, so you were saying last night that people asking for money and, and food because people are hungry are starting to get really aggressive is what you were saying. And, and you've never seen that in the past. Like the hunger is, is setting in, the hunger is growing such that the aggression is growing. Yes, I, um, I know we are in eight days uh, in this quarantine for eight days and it's until April 13, uh, but we are sure that it's going for the we are sure that it's going to 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 May because the peak of the virus is to be in three weeks. So um, people are uh, in the streets asking to nobody because nobody is there. And you have to think about uh, the society, but you think about first yourself. Um, we can buy things, but they can't. And they 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 used to go maybe in the garbage. Uh, outside of the restaurants and to to find some some food there, but the restaurants are closed, so the situation is getting worse and worse and worse uh, each day. So, so the idea then, what if I can kind of repeat what you just said? What I'm hearing is that on a normal basis, there's a kind of a balance between people who are out in the streets maybe who leave restaurants, they have leftover food, they give it away, they have some money, they give it away to people who are homeless or who are hungry, whether they're Colombians or Venezuelan refugees, of which there are one and a half million in Colombia. And there's sort of a balance, meaning that for, if there are no social services, if people aren't are not receiving social services, there's a way in which the community comes together to just hold people and but now the community is not in the streets so all of these people who are still in the streets themselves are really hungry they have nowhere to turn you know last night you were saying you were noticing people 
you know, going up to the stores and just checking all the doors constantly to see if anything was open or, and yeah, it's, it's just something that we're not thinking about unless we are in communities that are really on the edge. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not saying that the same people that is asking for food are the ones that are checking the doors, but that can change. I, the people that, that are checking the doors are robbers. I, I mean, they are organized crime. Um, mm. But it, it's not some, you cannot, I cannot say these people is this, this, or people is that, but I'm sure that when these people that is hungry uh, in, are desperate, they are going to try to do something else. And of, of course, there is service, public service for them, but it's not enough. They, they always are with the community and the community is always trying to, to help them. Maybe because they want to help them, I don't know. Other way, because uh, we know what what I mean, what is going on, and it's better to help them uh, than to confront them. So, so for you, there's the danger going outside. You feel the danger from the virus, but you also feel a risk just from the growing despair from so many people who are increasingly really hungry and really in need. Um, yeah, I, and it, I, it's only, it, go ahead, say that again. This situation shows us that, the real social situation, cause maybe you cannot, you can deny something if you are in a daily basis going to the job. And I, I don't know, you, you just have a life and you get used to, but in this case, it's not only the virus. I'm, I'm not really afraid of the virus. And I'm, I'm, if you ask me, which is my biggest fear, is not the virus, it's the other cocktail, the social cocktail that we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the social situation that could explode. This is what I've been saying. It's really my great fear also. And it's only been a few days in Bogota that you all have been in forced isolation. So if we experience, you're planning for another 18 days. So what happens when we get to day 10 or 12 or 15 and and the and the situation is really ready to explode. So um, it's just something. So thanks for thanks for, you know, coming in and talking about this, because it really for me, um, I think it it feels like it it's something that we should be thinking about as well. It is. Um, and and I'm not hearing us talk about it very much in the media in the United States. So, well, I also, I think it also depends on where you, where you are. Like it depends on what community you're mm -hmm. in, how obvious it is. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. so if you're in New York city, you're going to see things differently than if you're in state college, Pennsylvania, or in some very poor rural communities in the United States. Absolutely. I'm yeah. just saying in, in general, I'm not seeing a lot of arguments or a lot of, articles and conversations and discussions about how are we going to address the needs of the people who are most marginalized. And the word that you keep saying, Sam, is desperation, which is different than needs. I mean, is yeah. on top of extreme need. And I think that's actually something that's uh, hard to not be paying attention to, mm. you know? Yeah. Hey, so thank you, Renata. Uh, I will, we obviously we will continue to check in. Um, but I appreciate it. Yeah. And good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Nada. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Um, hey, so, um, Jeff, you can just go to the next slide. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's really sobering and actually what would be really nice, uh, I think for today, maybe when we get to the end of class and we have some time for some conversations, maybe it would be really nice if some of you on the stream could uh, join us and join us on video um, and, and, and tell us if maybe about a few things that you're seeing in your communities, um, because, uh, you know, at this point in time, once again, we're, I think we're sort of overlooking some of this, um, some of what is, is really uh, 
the, about the commons, you know, about all of us. And, you know, the title of today's class is Managing the Commons. And um, what, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about the um, some of the issues that I'm really seeing as a sociologist and that directly pertain to a class uh, to Social 119 and to what's happening around us. And Lori and I, you know, we, we for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about a wide range of issues related to um, the coronavirus and what's happening. And, and this is the issue that just keeps coming up again and again and again, uh, the one about the commons. And so let me just say quickly about the, the, the um, origin of this, if I could. Um, it really goes back to sort of a, a mind game that, that um, kind of emerged in the, in the, I think the first time, you know, I really saw a reference to it was in the late 18th century in this way. But the idea is this, um, hey, this is actually a really nice, um, this is like a, ba a perfect background for, for this. So the, the idea is imagine there are four families or four people and each of those four people have one sheep. And um, that sheep is the is a really important source of their livelihood, and um, and that there's a common area where the sheep graze, and so there's just the, the common area is just large enough to sustain all four sheep, and so what happens is people in the evening time they put their sheep out, and 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 the sheep graze, and this is the entire commons area, right? So you imagine it's not broken up. It's just one open area, but, you know, you just sort of see enough there for basically equal spots. You imagine that each one of the sheep is eating the same amount. And so they say, okay, so everyone is fine and everyone lives in a certain equilibrium. But now imagine that one person has the idea that says, um, hey, but if I have two sheep, then I could have twice as much um, uh, generate twice as much revenue from my two sheep and I'll be much better off and everything will be great. And so in that commons now, instead of four sheep, there are five sheep. But the problem is that the commons area doesn't, it's not able to sustain five sheep. It's only able to sustain three. And so over time, the commons area starts to degenerate. And it just degenerates and degenerates such that everybody loses. So even the person with the two sheep um, who presumably then would uh, would would be twice as, as well off as everybody else, they eventually lose too because the entire area um, is, is degraded such that it can't sustain any sheep because the extra sheep just put it over the top. And what this is called is the problem of the commons. That in, in what it references is, you know, everywhere around us, we're dealing with these issues of um, where the individual good is, has to be balanced out with the collective good and collective needs. And so Jeff, if you could put the next slide up and I'll, I'll show you this, um, that in a way it's, it's really very simple, y'all, right? And if you, if you get, trust me when I, when I say, you know, remember, remember when we did the class on freedom and determinism and I said, or, or, or choice versus chance. And I said, if you really understand what it is I'm saying here in this class, in these classes, then you will really, you'll be able to understand a lot about sociology and you will use this in your day-to-day -day life in terms of how to think about lots of different things. And so um, this is another one. You will use this a lot in the coming days as we're dealing with it. Yeah, that's, that's why I didn't want you to forget that, that this is actually one of the ways to think through some of the chaos that we're seeing. The chaos, chaos is around us. So leave, leave that up because I think it's really good um, if I talk about it in this way. So it's like you have on one side, you have individual desires, individual rights, individual needs, and they're balanced against the public good and the collective needs. And um, the two are always in operation together because as individuals, we're living inside of larger collectivities. And somehow I have my own life that I'm living and I have to find that this, this space 
um, around me within which I can live the life that is a good life, the life that makes me happy, the life that makes that fulfills all my needs, my wishes, my desires. And yet I have to live with all these other people around me because you do, you, we're social creatures. We cannot survive alone in the world. There, there are a few people who can try, but you know what, even the people, you watch these TV shows about, you know, people like up in a, the, the wilderness in Alaska, they're not surviving alone because even their, their guns and their bullets and so on, they're getting from other people, right? They're getting supplies, they're never alone. So the two things have to be balanced out together, okay? So, um, so all arguments about freedom revolve around this somehow, right? all arguments about freedom. It's like you, you, you can never be fully free because you can never live and act exactly as you want to live and act because you have to adjust your, your life. Our, we have to adjust our lives to uh, people around us. Okay. Do you want to say any, jump in or anything? Well, I was just going to say the idea of freedom is an idea because you're in a body and you're not free. Yeah, the yeah, body free. makes you not free either. Thank you. So just, you know. Just by nature of being born, we're yeah, not free. You when I used to teach the intro class, I would talk about socialization. And the moment you you start socializing children, um, the moment you start taking their freedom away. And in fact, if we weren't socialized, you know, we're not even human beings wouldn't even walk upright. Like the way I'm walking, I'm standing and the way I walk, when we see people um, who have not been socialized as children, they've been sequestered away um, and isolated and and not lived among other human beings. They don't walk, they don't stand like this. They don't walk like this. Forget about talking like this. They don't even walk in this way. They're, you know, they're, so the, the, the idea of freedom is just, it's, it's something you kind of strive for, but you never really arrive at because by virtue of being socialized, you've lost your freedom. Um, okay, so here, let me, get, Jeff, go, go to the next slide. And, and um, here is, uh, so we'll leave this up for a second, but there are three things I'm going to talk about, which are, uh, before we get to the coronavirus, so it's, it's uh, taxes, government, and rules or laws, okay? And it's a really simple thing. And once again, I, I, I just have to tell you, I think, you know, all teachers have an idea that the things they're saying are really, if you're a teacher, you're not, you have an idea that the things you're saying are really important, okay? Um, or you're not a teacher. But me, maybe I'm not a teacher because I believe that most of what I say is actually not very important, but a few things are actually really important. And this is, or valuable, I should say. And, and, and this is one of them. Okay. So, um, let me just taxes. Look, taxes. The, the, can I say something before you? Yeah, you can say that. Taxes. Yeah, <laughs> taxes. In, in Social 118, we're going to talk about taxes. Yeah, because when um, when you say the word taxes, I think I would probably want to go to sleep immediately. Yeah, okay. Just okay. Immediately. There's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Who cares? But I will say that I have, I've, when I heard you talk about this the first time, I was actually enthralled. Yeah. Like, why have I never thought about taxes like this? Before? That says something since you are, it, it, are, it are rarely true. ever enthralled by anything that I say. No, but really, it's it's yeah. like it's actually like like let's look at taxes. It's really interesting. So a lot of times people say sociology is the study of the obvious. Yeah. But evidently it needs obvious needs to be studied. Yeah, it does. Like once you start yeah. to like wake up to something, lots of other things make a different yeah. level of sense. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to give that little shout okay. out. Okay. All right. So listen, let's say um, let's say it snows and we had a huge snowstorm and like, so I'm going to, let me speak to there's, there's, let's say we get a huge snowstorm. Okay. And, and how are we going to get the snow off the roads? Well, the, in front of my house is actually pretty easy, right? Our house, we go do our driveway, we do our walk. We could actually do the street in front of our house. That's fine. But what about the County roads? What about the interstates? What about all these other roads? Like, what are we going to do? Well, we, you can't just send individuals out with snow shovels and say, hey, go out and, 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 and you know, shovel the snow, right? Like, go take it. Everyone grab your shovels and let's go. We, we don't do that, right? What we do is we pay people to go out and shovel 
all of the collective property, all the collective roads and spaces that need to be shoveled, meaning that the, the places for which individuals are not really responsible, right? But we are all responsible as, for, as a collectivity, like the interstates, right? It's, it's the, the, the federal government, the state governments, and the state roads, and so on, right? And so what we, the way we pay for that is that we say, hey, we're all going to contribute to the pot. And everyone takes a little bit of their money, pull your wallet out, and you're going to contribute every year to a little bit for all of these needs that society has that, that us as individuals cannot take care of, right? So you could say, um, so such as shoveling snow, right? There's just no way to do it otherwise. And so we put money in the pot and we say, okay, we're going to use this money to do that. And then we have other things, other needs, right? Other collective needs for which, you know, we really can't, like how, how are we going to, you know, the, the sewage systems and water and electric, all sorts of things, right? That are, that are issues that people have to deal with, right? And so we take money and we put it in a pot and we say, okay, let's divide that pot up and take care of these needs. We'll, we'll, I'll, Lori and I, we buy our own food. We, you know, we take care of painting our house and all the th our, our internet bills, all sorts of things that we have to do. But there are other things that we just can't do. We don't know how to do. Like when we flush our toilet and it's got to go somewhere, it's like we, someone somehow we pay for that. Well, we could be responsible for it ourselves as individuals, but it's actually much more efficient if we pool with people around us in our community and we build a more efficient system and we all put our money together and we make that happen. Right. So this is essentially taxes. Essentially, these are taxes. And even when we privatize things like we could pay, you know, we could we could get, you know, our whole neighborhood together and say, hey, you know what, we're, we're, we're all libertarians here and we don't care about we want to downsize the government. In fact, we want to have no government at all. Like we're going to build this community. We're going to have no government and we're all going to be responsible. Well, the first thing we're going to do is start deciding what our collective costs are. And we're going to start pooling our money. And we're going to pay for the services that us as individuals can't render ourselves. In other words, we're going to pay taxes. So it doesn't matter who you are or what you are, you're going to pay a tax. And you can call it a payment to a private company, but it's essentially when enough people do it, it's a tax. And so what people are arguing about with, with regard to taxes, and this is like a Republican thing, and a Democrat thing, and a libertarian thing, and a socialist thing, all we're arguing about with regard to taxes is A, how much of our private money are we willing to spend to take care of the collective needs that are really going to benefit us? And the problem is there are always going to be collective, there are going to be things that we spend the money on that I don't benefit from, and other things that we spend money on that you don't benefit from, but maybe I do. And so like, for example, we pay, we paid so probably, my God, since we moved in here, probably $60,000, maybe 70 in school, like $90,000, probably at least in school taxes. We don't have kids. It's like, why am I spending $90,000 in school taxes? Like, it makes no sense. Like, I don't want to pay that. I want to live in a community where you only pay for school taxes if you have kids, right? And then our neighbor kids that, you know, they have like eight kids. And they pay the same amount as we do. And I'm like, that's not fair, but here's the deal. But it balances out in the end. So we argue about it, but in the, but you got to somehow balance things out. And that's what taxation is. And government is all government is are people that we put into positions of power to make decisions about how to spend the collective money and what to do. And we argue about it and we say like, who are these people and what are they and why should they do it? But, but you gotta have a pool of money that everybody contributes to, or you want everyone to contribute to ideally, and you want them to contribute to it fairly, right? And how do you do that? Um, that? So we're arguing about that, but you want, you gotta have a pool of money and then you use that money to pay for the needs that impact or the services that are rendered to everybody in the community somehow, okay? And in, and then in, in the middle of all that are all the gray areas, okay? So the problem of the commons, right? So we go back you know, to, to this uh, as an example with the sheep, right? The problem of the commons. So all we're doing is, is making, making decisions about how to divide this up in a way that's fair for everybody so that we all can participate and we can kind of make it work. And, and, and 
what we're seeing here with taxes, with government, um, with laws and rules is about how to manage the common space. There are common spaces, common needs, how to manage behavior and how to manage individual behavior versus group behavior. And this is what we're gonna talk about with regard to the coronavirus. That, that you know, I have things that I wanna do, but if I do them, it, it, it might infringe upon the rights or the needs of the community at large. And then, so if I step over a line, just so, cause I wanna do what I wanna do, then wait, but what about the other people? And then we start, Ask, assessing, hey, by the way, take a deep breath. Um, this is, dudes, remember, I, I really don't think I have much to say about anything, but I think if you get, if you get this, if you really get it, you, it'll be so much easier when, when, when you have to start paying your taxes and you gotta be like, oh my God, why am I doing this? Right? Like you got, you just, you make sense of it. Right? So, what we do, the other thing that we're doing in all of this, because I said we have taxes, we have government, we have laws and rules, is all of our laws and all of our rules are just the things, the, the messages that we have, the ways in which we try, try to ensure that the individual rights and the community rights are somehow balanced out, are somehow fair and balanced. And then we get unbalanced, then we have to you know, pass a law or a rule to get them balanced again, and maybe they get unbalanced this way and we have to take a rule or a law away. But somehow all they are is that. And so we're gonna give give examples of, of this in, in a hot minute. Um, but, you know, the rules and laws about, look, everybody's gotta pay their taxes because if you don't pay your taxes, we can't get the snow plowed up on Route 80. And if we don't get the snow plowed up on Route 80, then, we have a, then everybody has a problem. And I'm like, well, I don't have a problem because I don't drive a car and I never go on 80. So it's not an issue for me. Ah, oh, really? Okay, well, good. Then we're going to pass an extra law to make sure that you pay your taxes because you have a reason, you have an incentive to not do it because it doesn't affect you, but it affects all these other people and they're all paying their taxes in to, to, they're, they're putting money into the pot to pay for things that you benefit from. And so presumably around the board, we're all just equally, you know, it, it balances out in the long run somehow. Okay. So yes. Hey, um, an idea that came to mind in the chat and it's something that I've talked to a close friend of mine about quite a bit is school taxes for public schools. Um, people who yeah. go to private schools or people whose kids don't go to school. And I know you mentioned it too. Um, they're always like, why do I have to pay for these taxes? Cause I don't have a kid in school. And it's like, because we're investing in the future of our children so that they're not complete morons that go out to the workforce without any knowledge. Like I don't yeah, like the fact that my taxes are going for certain things, but that doesn't mean that it's yeah. necessarily an evil thing or something that I can get away from. It's a well, presumably it balances out. And it does. Right. So yeah. presumably it balances out, right? Look, so let's say that we do have a child and we send our child to a Quaker school. And let's say we're spending $10,000 a year for the Quaker school. And yet we still got to pay our taxes in state college. It's like, wait a minute. But our child is there. And so in some communities, maybe you would get a tax break to say, listen, you are, you're going to private, uh, you know, a private school. So we'll give you a little bit of tax break. Why? Because it's just fair. In other communities, we'll, we would say, yeah, but listen, if you have the money to send your kid to a private school, then we're still balancing it out because we have all these people who really aren't making anywhere near the amount of money that you are. And they, they're not able to contribute what you're able to contribute for the public. It just gets immensely complicated. And, and you said though that it oh, it balances out. Um, I think what you mean you must ideally it balances right. out. Right, and I think what you're talking about is between the individual and the social world. Yes, but I but I also know some people are saying like, is this an econ class or a social a social class or how is this relevant? This is sociology. Yeah. To see economics is the sociology of the production and consumption of goods and how to fund that. That's what economics, economics is it its foundation, a sociology class. And so, and you can't talk, you can't do sociology without talking about economics. And when you're talking about race and ethnic relations, fundamentally, these issues are in play all the time. I was listening to Tucker Carlson last night and, uh, and from, he was doing a, a piece on Fox News. And I'm like, 
That is sociology, my friend, even though he was talking about economics. I mean, that is race and ethnic relations at the core in sociology. So let, let me keep going, so because I know that I'm behind. So listen, go to the next slide really fast. Here's an example, just registering for world in conversation. When you don't when you don't follow the rules and register and the rules, the rules only exist because if individuals don't do what they're supposed to do, then we all then you all get hurt, right? So like you can't why why is why do we say you can't sign up for groups and not to come? You can do that once, but you can't do it multiple times. Why? Because we can't have unlimited groups. And when you just sign up and then decide not to sign up and then not to come, and then you go on again and you sign up, and then let's say you do that three or four times, you've taken seats away from the person who doesn't get on there right away and sign up. And not everyone can be the first ones on the sign up sheet and or you go onto the system and sign up. And then, you know, you just do whatever you want to do. And that's good for you, but you're harming all these other people. And like, and so we, we don't have an unlimited number of seats. So therefore we impose all these rules. And then we say, Hey, last yesterday, I sent the email out. If you, from here on out, if you sign up for a global and don't show up for that global, you will not be able to sign up for another one. Why? Because so many of you have signed up for globals and not shown up and we can't open any more global groups. Our, our partners are around the world do not have any more opportunities. They're dealing with the coronavirus also, right? And you're like, oh, I, I overslept or, or you, you know, what, everyone has a reason, right? But, but I don't know what the good reason is. Did your internet really go off? Like you're sending an email, oh, my internet stopped working. Really? Like, why is it everybody's internet suddenly stops working on globals and it doesn't stop working on everything else? You know what I mean? And so therefore we just set the rule and we say no. And that's how it is, right? So just like the person who sends their kid to private school still has to pay public school taxes, maybe your internet went out, but you know, that's what it is, right? And so- um, So it, it makes me think if you go back to your original example, um, so you're in, when one person decides I'm gonna work for myself and get exactly. a two sheet, um, and then everybody goes down because yep. there's no more food for the sheet, yep. right? So it's like someone has to come in or some authority has to be there to say, no, 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 you're only allowed to have one. Exactly. So the person whose internet really does go down tomorrow morning and they can't do a global dialogue really does. And it's really not your fault. You get penalized because 50 people in the past several weeks have just slept in and decided they didn't feel like getting up and doing their global. So you actually, who is a, like a really responsible student and trying to do the best thing, you get harmed by the 50 or 20 or 30 people who weren't responsible, but that's the way it is. Life isn't fair and that's how we go. And that's what we're managing all around. So go to the next slide, bro. Coronavirus. I can learn to understand you much better if I can. We turn, all Lori and I are seeing is the, the problem of the commons here with the coronavirus behavior, right? So it's just, it's constantly. So here, um, we can go back, Jeff, you can actually go from that just coronavirus screen right to the next one, um, which is that we can start with the hoarding behavior and just, the, you know, like, look, it's, it, it's not really a big deal if you hoard toilet paper, right? It's like, but first off, you, you know, it's hoarding though. Can, can we just, can you just say how, how you're understanding that in terms of what you're talking about? Yeah. In terms of what we're talking about is, you know, you going out and you buying up the, the collective, you know, there's only a limited amount of products in the world, my friends, right? Like there's only a limited amount of toilet paper or whatever, or doors or picture frames or chairs or shirts or whatever, right? There's a limited amount. And when you, and then we know because this is the, the free market and, and the free market works really, really well. We know what the, the, the demands are. And then Jeff, leave that slide up to the hoarding behavior slide. Um, we 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 kind of know what the market conditions are and the demands are, and then we know what the supplies are. And the free market really makes that it re, it works very very well. But when people then jump into the free market and they take advantage of it, meaning or they go out and they engage in unpredictable behavior, like they go out and buy a whole shit ton of toilet paper, which they never did before, and they all take it home and they put it in their closets. And then what happens is they have, they have an individual right to do that. I can go to the store and I can buy all the toilet paper until that store says, no, you can't do that anymore, right? So I can do that, that's my individual right, but that individual right infringes on 
the, the collective on, on the individual rights of other people and the collectivity and the public good. But in the case of toilet paper, you know, it's actually the public good is probably stop wiping your our rear ends with toilet paper. We should be using bidets and we should be using water. You know, it's much more sanitary. All we do is we take this paper and we rub it on our arses and we just, I don't know, most of us are just like spreading poop all over our arses like there are better ways to do this my friends <laughs> you know what i mean so just like so it would probably be good for us if we just learned a better way to clean our rear ends but when it comes to masks or medicines or other things that people hoard that actually or gels or hand cleaner that actually would keep people alive uh, that's a totally different issue regarding the public good. So you can come off that slide now. Um, and so like your hoarding behavior is actually harming. It's not just about the public good. Like we were teaching them how to clean their rear ends with soap and water, which is better in the long run and more sanitary and so on and so forth, right? No, but we're actually um, ensuring that people stay alive. So like doctor, medical, emergency staff, medical staff, hospital staff, they just don't even have what they need because other people have gone out and hoarded it and they don't need it. And so people are dying because of someone's behavior. That's a that's a, a, a very different issue. So here, go, go also. Oh, no, wait, it's not a very yep. different issue. It's the same issue. It's the same issue, but you see how it has implications. It has, it has different impact. Yeah, huge, huge because impact. That's exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Right? The sheep, I'm just. Yeah, the sheep, yep. It's like. It's the same issue as hoarding masks or or yep. sanitizer or whatever supplies. Yeah. So the so the the person that lives in this house, the sheep who who went out and secretly bought two sheep because they did it secretly, right? And then they secretly put that sheep out on the land and nobody else knows about it. See, I, I didn't say that with the example, but that's part of the example. It's like, well, it, hang on, but that's actually problematic because if they were just harming themselves, it would be okay. So if you go on, you know, if you go and buy up all the masks or medical supplies and in the end, you know, you're really just going to harm yourself because you're the one who's going to get sick and the medical, the, the staff who are treating you, they don't have what they need to treat you really correctly. And so on, you die, but you're actually harming all these other people. So that's where it, it, the, the, this is all, when you don't pay your taxes. You know what I mean? It's like you don't pay, you don't, we, when we don't do the things that we're bound to do by this sort of collective agreement, then, then we get hurt. Right. So like if I don't pay my school taxes and I don't know, the kids in my neighborhood become delinquents and then they break into our house and, you know, or break into our car and, you know, whatever. Like it's like it's in my interest. Just like go to school and become functioning adults. You know what I mean? So when you come to my, when you when you one day are part of Social 119, you actually follow directions and do what you're supposed to do. And then don't send us these emails like like the end of the world is coming. By the way, it, it, it's all good. Don't don't worry about your grades. It's it's okay. It's all right. Can you tell? Like don't. It's okay. It's all good. We'll we'll, we'll work it out. All right. Okay. So go to the. Can you go to the next one? Um, the next slide. So here's here's one that where you see actually the tipping point is in the other direction with like forced isolation. So. We, you know, we're saying, wait, look, wait, can I just, can I, I got yeah. to stop you for a second. Yeah. Just a hoarding one. I know you don't have to go back to the, the slide, but just, so what you said was, um, similar. I mean, you've, you've explained this thing about the commons, right? Yep. You can understand, we can understand something from that, but what, are, what would you say about this quote hoarding, um, behavior that we're talking about now? That's, that's more than what we're hearing because we're hearing on the news cycles, people and in social media talking about hoarders and no one's really like celebrating people that are hoarding. So like, what else should we, could we be thinking about with this? What well, you could be saying? thinking just about the inequality in the world, right? Like somebody emailed me today, a, co a colleague who does a lot of work in Africa and they were saying, you know, like in all of Uganda, he, I think what he said was there are like 34 beds in an intensive care unit intensive care beds, 34, and all of you got it. Yeah, and so like, you, one of the things I talked about in the United States about, you know, earlier in the semester is one of the reasons we're so rich, we didn't get rich just because we worked twice as hard. We get rich because we partly, to a great degree, we got rich because of the relationships that we imposed on other people in other countries. And so there's a way in which we're also hoarding resources and hoarding, um, knowledge and hoarding all sorts of things that really benefit us at the it, it, against other people 
And so, so, right. So how does that, so how can we understand this, ha- what's happening right now at the, like on the microcosm of, of somebody going to the store and buying more than they ever will need? Um, how can you understand that? Because, well, because human beings have a natural fear. And so one of the jobs of a government or are of a people or of leaders is to understand the kinds of fears that people are going to have. And so we're like, hey, whoa, we're headed into something really scary. I'm the leader here. I'm really thoughtful. I'm saying like, yo, people are going to start acting in ways that it's not good for the larger collective good, right? So this is actually could bring us down. So what I need to do is go out and ensure I need to start passing laws and rules and whatever and talking about this in a way that keeps people from doing things that really is not in their interest. It's not in the public interest, but in the end, if it's not in the public interest, it's not in their own individual interest because maybe hoarding, I got a lot of toilet paper, I have masks or I have this, but it's not in my interest when I own all the masks and the hospitals all around me don't and then people start dying left and right and I got to deal with the consequences of dead bodies on the street or whatever it is, just like people are really hurt because now all of our resources are going to go toward that. You see, like it's all like linked together. And so our job is to say temper these things. Like, let's work it, right? Let's it's also work how it. a sociologist sees government. That's how it sees government. It's like Renata, right? Look, the, the, the government in Bogota has got to say, we got a problem here. We got all these people, including these Venezuelan refugees who are in this city. They have nowhere to go. They are hungry. They're going to start acting in ways that are really not in the public interest at all. We got to step in and do something about this. Right. So what are we going to do? And so this is where you're we're always in that balance. Hey, so we it looks like we have a question. Jeff, you can come in. Andrew, Andrew, that? Andrew had a question yeah, I got about, you, about yeah. taxes. So go ahead, man. All right. Sorry. Go ahead, bro. So how you doing, Sam? Killing it, man. Hey, hey what's ahead. your name? Andrew. Andrew. I've spoken in the class before. Um, All right. So my question is like, when you talk about the idea of taxes and taxation and, you know, the common good, you know, what's the point that, you know, it doesn't become right because like I've grown up in Southern California where, you know, obviously taxes are very high. I've watched my dad run his own business, get a lot of, you know, he pays a lot of taxes off it. We're not like multimillionaires or anything like that. So like, to what point does it become harmful to society just to be, you know, I guess over That's the question, man. You want your taxes to be, here's just the, to, to, you want the good life for as many people as possible, right? So you have to find that balance. You want the taxes to be as low as they possibly can be while addressing the needs of the collectivity without giving without holding up or taking care of people in the collectivity who don't want to do their fair share. And the and other so, side is, what do you, um, is the piece where there are people that have a lot more than other people. There aren't just people that have less, yeah. right? Because we always tend to look at, oh, but why should we give extra to those people who don't have as much? It's like, what about the people who have an exorbitant, uh, exorbitant amount of resources, right? How do, so it's a similar question. Like, how do we make this fair yeah. when you have a lot more to begin with? Do you get do you therefore then have to give more? Why and why should and why should you give more? What if you earn that and you did well? And like right. so Lori's brother is an electrical contract, owns his own business, has lots of employees, and like no, man. he has he's a small business. <laughs> well, it's a small business, but you know, employees, employees come in and go. But but you know, it's like, whoa, man, the amount of taxes that he pays, and it's in New Jersey, and what he does and what he has to do and what he's responsible for, and like, and then sometimes, you know, I, I don't know, it's like Dude, that, that is not fair that you should carry this burden. And so somehow the good life, the good society is where we just find a balance. Individuals have enough freedom to do what they need to do, um, but without really impinging on the freedoms of other people. And we take responsibility for what we need to do. But yet I don't look to everybody else to just take care of me. So there's yeah. a there, so somehow we have to balance that out. And I, it's, it's a, really hard. But it's a system that's built on, um, you know, power relationships, right? So like what you're saying, Andrew, right? Yeah. Is um, 
yeah, how come sometimes like somebody like my parents or my dad, we get the short end of the stick sometimes. Yeah, you do sometimes, right? It depends on who has power, who makes what decisions, which things are priorities, who decided that we're going to fund this instead of that. And which industry he's in, right? If he's in the right industry in California, he's got enough powerful people in Sacramento who've passed all these laws and like set stuff up. So he's like, all right, we got it taken care of. But if he's in an industry in California, he's a business owner. Yeah. And those in people in his industry aren't represented in Sacramento in the same way, then he's going to get screwed and he's going to pay a lot more. And yeah. so it's like, yeah. And he takes risks, right? Yeah. Oh, big it's risks. Like, yeah. It's a risk, man. You start your own business. You're like, dude, the pressure of that, the risk, like, oh my God. Right. And then everybody thinks, well, you have your own business, so you're rich. And like, no, man, that's not how it works. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, it, it took yeah, a while. So, to that's get, what I'm saying. Yeah, it took a while to get to this point, but I just I see him bearing all the risk, all the stress. Like that's a lot more work than you know, 99 percent of the world puts in into it. You know, working these 14 hour days. Like, dude, you know, I'm sorry, I puts a bad taste in my mouth when now I'm probably gonna have to pay for a decent amount of my college because you know that extra money every year that's taken is going to things who much of us feel here in California are just absolute waste. And that's dude, exactly. Work so of here. Country. It, it's very similar to the risk that, not very similar, but in a different way, just to parallel it to the risk that all the medical workers are dealing with right now, that yeah. they have to like take all these risks for themselves when all these other people were, were allowed for whatever to go out and like hoard things or make decisions or make decisions about isolating and not isolating themselves. And like, dude, because you chose to go not isolate and get the virus, and now we have beds in the hospital, not only are all the wards filled up, but the the hallways are filled up. And like, we have so many people that we've run out of masks and we've run out of ventilators. And I now as a medical person have to take more and more risks because of your silly decisions, which then comes to our second example here, which is the one about isolation, right? Like, yeah. you know, we, this is what the, the commons issue is with isolation that we're saying, no, you, we're not allowing you to go out because it's it's bad for the entire public, for the common good, when we just let you go out and do what you want to do. And you might be the guy, for example, like that kid in Florida who's just like, yeah, I don't care if I get the virus. It's all good, right? But like, yeah, it's good for you, dude. But you're going to go give it to all these other people and then we're screwed. And so therefore, we're going to clamp down on your individual right to party on the beaches of Miami. Yeah. So like, and then now, now we've got another rule. Right. And so it's like, oh, man, you know, then that's not fair. And it's like, ah, so this is the balance all the time. Yeah, it's yeah. it's towing a fine line. And, you know, and my dad's software is actually caught up in the middle of like, his software's medical records. So it's been had to be completely changed the last three weeks. So he, Dude. everyone's feeling it. It's it's nuts. Dude. Oh, man. Yeah, it's I really intense. Man. Dude, <laughs> yeah. thanks for thanks for calling in. We're going to yeah, like, we're going to jump off. But yeah, yeah, thanks, man. Great question. Um, so go, go back to the, you can go back to the slide, uh, on forced isolation, but you know, you can see where it weighs in the other way, right? It's like my individual, we're all over the world. People are going like, Whoa, my individual rights are being curtailed. I can't go out into the street. I can't go do the kinds of things I want to do yet yeah, because you might pass this on. And so, so what do we do then? Like we then make, so check this out. This, this is actually a really good, a good example of the balance, right? So we say, okay, this is good. It's public good. You know, we're going to pass a few laws and we're going to tell people, hey, like stay in your houses. Don't go out unless you really need to go out and, you know, all sorts of things, including like, you know, walk your dog and, you know, that that's fine. Like we're going to do that, right? But individuals are going to do what individuals do. We're going to push. We're going to push a little more and I'm going to walk my dog not once a day, not twice a day, but five times a day. And then I'm going to decide I got to drive my dog to the dog park and then I got to go down to the beach. And then suddenly all these people are doing all these things because, you know, you give, you know, you give an inch and then maybe they take a mile. Right. And then I'm driving to the beach because I'm going to let my dog run on the beach. What's the problem? I'm not going to give the coronavirus to anybody. I mean, my I get I go out to my garage. I open the garage door, I drive out, I go right to the beach, I get out right on the beach, I let my dog out, the dog runs around. I'm not giving the virus to anyone. Why is there a law telling me I can't go to the beach and I can't do this thing? Like, what's the problem? Well, maybe I'm driving home from the beach and my car breaks down. And then we got to call a tow truck. 
then the tow truck driver comes and then you got to take all my information and maybe in the exchange somehow I actually have the virus and then I give it to the tow truck driver. And then like somebody else has to drive me home. So I got to call a taxi like, hey, can you come and drive me home? And then the taxi driver gets the virus. And then suddenly and then when that's happening, not with just me and one person, but it's happening with lots of people. The government, the government, people making the laws step in and they say, no, nobody will do anything. You will not even walk out onto your sidewalk. What do you mean I can't walk out on my sidewalk? No, if we see you outside of your house, you will be arrested. Like in Germany right now, in certain parts of the Rhine, in, in the Rhineland, in Germany, if you congregate, if more than two people congregate in public, you get a 200 euro fine. It's like, what do you mean two people congregate? What if I'm just standing next to my neighbor? Like I just saw him and I said, hello, doesn't matter, 200 euro fine. Just like, no. And so that's what we do. And that's why we, in the United States, we have like 15 million laws on the books because there's always exceptions. And that's why the syllabus for Social 119 is 12 pages long. Why? Because everybody finds a way to like, to, to escape one of the clauses. Well, it doesn't say in the syllabus that when I'm taking the quiz, I have to da, da, da. I'm like, oh, you're right. It doesn't say that. It will next semester. And then over the past 30 years, that syllabus went from one page, my friends, one page to like 12 pages, 10 point font, because I got to cover every rule that I could possibly cover so that I can just stop with the nonsense. Whereas what I want to do is just say, come in, give yourselves A's. I don't care. Just come in, come to class. All I want you to do is come to class. Just come to class, do your thing, um, read these readings. I don't want to give you a quiz. It's a pain in the ass. Just raise your right hand, Scouts Honor, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, whatever it is. I read the readings, I promise you. I read the, I, I watched the videos, I promise you. Okay, good. There, there's an A, but that's not what happens. Why is it that you know what? What do we have? We have 240 people. 240 people watching the stream, Jeff. 240 people. Yeah. No, no it's like 704. Oh, okay, it's it's said 240 since we started. Why is yeah? Why is mine say 740? Okay. Yeah, why know. is it that you know? And yeah, it, it, in any case, right? It's like the ch cheating, right? People just find these amazing ways to cheat. And like, I'll accept a certain amount of cheating. I don't really care. But like, my problem is when the cheating becomes excessive or when students start to complain about other people cheating, then I'm like, well, that's not fair. I, I guess I got to step in because students are demanding that I address the issues of cheating. And so now I got to pass new laws and new rules and the public good which is to have as few rules as possible. Just live life. Just enjoy. Be happy. Learning is fun. Learning is exciting. Like it shouldn't be about going to prison. Going to school is not going to prison and it shouldn't be that way. But it becomes that way because you got to balance the public good with individual rights and responsibilities and liberties. Okay, man. Hey, we're going to go with the next one. Ready? Uh, so, Remember, next slide, individual. <laughs> that was actually a little tiny rant there that I enjoyed. More than a little tiny rant. All right. Okay. <laughs> so listen, there are all these, and here's another thing with, so the government's going to step in. Like we as a community are going to step in and make decisions about things, right? So sometimes we make decisions about things to, we, we want to try to control behavior that doesn't seem like we should be engaging in the control of that kind of behavior, but there are all these invisible strings or these ways in which, you know, people are, are people act that we understand and that we know and that we see. And, and so we step in because, because people don't always act in their own best interests because they don't even, we don't even know why we act. So this goes back to a week ago, Tuesday, when I talked about these invisible strings and suicide and behaviors such as that. So here, let me go to the next slide with the, with the airplanes, right? Um, so like, here's an example of individual strings, right? So you got these, you got these, um, you have scammers, right? And scammers go out and they scam people. Like I get in, I got, it's you know. It's an official definition. Yeah. Scammers. Scam they scam yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hang on. Scammers, they, they're, they, 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 what is it? Like they lie to people. They, they manipulate people. Yeah, they, they're opportunistic. And, you know, they, they lie to people and they, they work on people's weaknesses, right? So, like, I get emails from 
I get, I get emails from women all over the world, my friends, my wife, you should know this, who want to have sex with me. And they think I'm sexy and they think I'm awesome and they're really no sex with me. So be aware of that because I get emails every day, right? Most of them are in my spam box. I don't know why they should come right to my inbox. But but so here I, I put these two examples of, of these televangelists who are, you know, Try, they're getting their the people that want to follow them on television, trying to get them to give them money to buy private jets because these televangelists need private jets because they need to fly around the world really fast so they can minister to lots and lots of people. And so, you know, if Creflo Dollar, just Creflo Dollar should be like, uh, <laughs> do, you, do, do you need anything more than that, Creflo Dollar? But they, these guys, like, they go on television, they, they preach so-called preach the word of God. And they they tell people that, you know, in, in, in no uncertain terms that, listen, they'll be closer to God. God will reward them if they just reach into their pocketbooks or they get their checkbooks and write checks and send them to them so they can buy these really fast, beautiful jets that cost like 30 or $40 million. Right? So first off, if you're dumb enough to send these MFers money, right? Then you don't, you shouldn't have the money because like you, you should not, you, you are like, you are not responsible to have that money that you send to them for whatever reason, because you might do something even dumber with it. So better that they have it, but here's the problem. But we know that a lot of people get scammed. And so like, how does it, if you, if they can convince you, if I look, if I can convince you right now to send me a thousand dollars, just because I need to buy some new shirts, then like, you don't deserve that thousand dollars, my friends, right? But the fact is, I can go and I can get people to give me a thousand dollars. I can manipulate them and they'll do that. And so then we got we say, we step in and we say, people, people have the side of them that's weak and it's actually not good for the public interest. So we're going to pass laws against scamming and we're going to pass laws that, that uh, make it illegal for people to do these kinds of things. And you know, that's just going to be the way it is. And we say, do we really need a law for that? Like how many, we have 15 million laws on the books. Now we have 15 million and one. It's like, yeah, because it's in the public good. Why? Because when these people lose their life savings to like these televangelists or scammers from Nigeria or wherever it is, then it's a problem for the rest of us. You know, it's just a problem for society, like gambling addicts, right? It gets a problem. The rest of us have to address the issues. And so therefore, yeah, we're going to put a law on the books because it's in the interests of the community. Scammers from Nigeria? Yeah, like, I mean, you know, that's the only place. Yeah, the Nigeria. I got an email yesterday from a Nigerian prince who told me I got $5 million, <laughs> dude. But this is the thing. Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? $5 million. I mean, I'm like, yeah, dude, $5 million. That's awesome. Right. So here. So here's another one. Next slide. Um, so in the past, um, these are a couple. Take a look at these advertisements. This, this is from cigarette smoking advertisements in the past, right? Look at this is how people sold tobacco. Dude, dude t tobacco was just accepted and sold and to anybody and whoever wanted it. I mean, there were no rules on it until finally we started getting together and deciding people, you know, people, the government stepped in and started saying, wait a minute, this tobacco is actually killing people, right? And enough doctors stepped in and said like, no, we're going to have, we're going to deal with this. Look at, you know, you look at these and it's like, Dang, man. And so it's a problem, right? Okay, look at that. You Like using babies to, to sell. Um, oh, my God. So anyway, go, go to the next slide. So we, so we start passing laws against you. You can't use children to sell tobacco products. Children can't buy tobacco products. Um, you know, all sorts of laws against it because we just make these decisions, even though anybody with a brain would have known that they'd – smoking tobacco a hundred years ago or a thousand years, it can't be good for your lungs, but whatever, it doesn't matter. We start passing laws. And now 98% of anybody who's any, anybody, doc, people who study um, the body will say that, no, actually smoking will shorten your life, either from cancer or from heart disease or something. By the way, incidentally, 98% of all climate science, people who study climate science, argue that human beings are having a detrimental impact on the climate and in fact um, are directly causing much of the uh, um, climate 
collapse and changes that we're seeing. And so it's funny that 98% of medical researchers argue that, yes, yeah, smoking is actually going to shorten your life. Nobody really questions like the 2%. The 2% must get their funding from tobacco companies, right? And so 98% of all people studying climate change um, and climate science is arguing, like, no, actually human beings are directly involved, but we don't question where the other 2% come from. We somehow th that 2% becomes more, they, they become like this really loud voice Whereas the 98%, we argue as though there's, it's inconclusive that, you know. Okay, so anyway, um, so therefore we pass rules. Final thing, right? And Jeff, if we have, if anybody else wants to ask a question, go to the last slide. So this is the issue of discrimination. Okay, so here we are directly in social 19, right? Um, discrimination, Lori Lynn, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this and then you can jump in with a, some kind of a response. Hey, I'm just, okay. I passed over the other one because I have to get to this one okay. because there's a quiz question on it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want to stay with the other one. I know. I, it's just like I needed to, I don't have a quiz question over my rant, but, you know. But here, let me do the discrimination piece really fast. Um, not really fast, but so this is what we're arguing about with, um, with discrimination questions, right? It's like we know that individuals discriminate against other individuals. So individuals can hurt the rights of other individuals, can infringe on the rights of other individuals, right? And so the government then has to decide when is the discrimination problematic enough? It does happen. There's discrimination in the world. It's real. It happens, right? When is it problematic enough or systematic enough that the government should step in and pass laws that curtail the discrimination or make it illegal, right? And so we're all arguing about this all the time. The the other side, the other part of that though is that I think we have excavated in the United States, perhaps in more than in any place, is uh, what happens when the government itself is creating patterned inequality between mm -hmm. people, right? Yeah. So it's like the government, and I know you're not saying this, but when we talk about the government in the way you've been talking about it, it's as if they're separate. Yeah, no, I'm talking, and I'm talking about the sociology of the no, government. No, I know. Go ahead. But what's so interesting is then the government itself becomes a subject of sociological lenses, where yeah. you can see the, you know, like when Andrew was asking, why is it like this versus like that? Well, because because some people interests and certain, they support those interests. Yeah, because somehow you're gonna you need to put some people into positions to make decisions on behalf of the collectivity, right? So we have these things, you know, we call them elections, we call them whatever, politicians, whatever. But they, somebody has to make decisions about the collective good. And then all this nefarious activity can happen. It does happen. Does happen among those people, how they get elected, who elects them, whatever happens. It's like, oh my God, right? And so basically then what we find ourselves arguing about and certainly is relevant to a class like this, well, how much does, how much should we step in to stop certain forms of discrimination, especially when it's happening systematically against some people much more than other people. And when do we step in and when do we not step in and how far and how often? This is partly what Tucker Carlson was talking and about. And many times we can't even get to those really important conversations and questions and decisions because we're because we're having to fight against the government in this case itself that isn't um, fair and isn't proper yeah, right. representing people. So right, like we right, exactly. talk about like what's the public good when we know that the public good isn't even being served. No, like when cases. when's the last time we heard from Native Americans about their experience in the United States, right? Like when when's the last time that we had a public conversation about Native Americans, Native peoples, and what what they experience every day. And so, the, well, we don't. And so that sort of gets pushed aside, right? And so, yeah, and so, so this is part... So what we're arguing about are, are these things, and it, it, once again, it goes back to the balance. And when discrimination is happening against one sector of society, it's actually problematic for the larger public good. And what's really interesting right now with the coronavirus and what I think I'm hoping you're hearing um, Sam talking about is how, oh, something starts to happen and we realize, oh, we have to do something about that. We need some authority or we need some law to stop people from acting in their own good and acting in the public good. And so like what's happening right now is obviously we're in this extremely dynamic moment that most people don't think that they have any way to understand how 
how to operate and navigate. And so people are making decisions and law and eventually laws um, and policies that not only may or may not be useful now, but then are going to stick. Yeah. Right. And we're going to we make decisions in these midst of uh, panic and fear and unknown. And then we have to live with them. Right. Yeah. So we're in that moment right now. And you all will be seeing as you, you know, 10 and 20 years from now, like, oh, that happened in 2020. Yeah. Well, we're, we're now what we say is, oh, that happened. In, that was After post 9-11. 9/11. Yeah. yeah. We're like, oh, the Patriot. Act. Oh, oh, we're still dealing that, with that. Right. So so that's like what's so incredibly fascinating right yeah. now as a sociologist. Yeah. Like how many things are how many well, how much of the public good is actually just the public good in this very limited amount of time. Yeah, like people yesterday, some students were in a, I was in a dialogue and they were like, people should be arrested if they're out in public. And then there Wait. should be martial law. I'm like, oh. Wait, hang on, by the way, that was a black student that said that, right? One of them was a black student. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hang on, so got this. So listen, those, those of you who, you'd have this idea, you know, uh, black people can never be conservative or, or fascist, right? After 9-11, it was the blacks, you know, remember it was like systematically almost across the board. We should profile board. everyone from the Middle East. Everyone from the <laughs> Middle East. It was the black students that were leading the charge on that. Like, I'm like, oh my God, do you realize what you just said? <laughs> Mind blowing, but, yeah, anyway. but anyway. But the point is like, this is really intense and why it's just like, we can't just make any law right now. Yeah, it yeah. It just be too yeah. extreme. And yet we know what the consequences of that could be, right? Yeah, so. it's, it's, in, it's a balance, my friends. And anyway, hey, I think we have a question. Yes. So before we get to the question with that question, um, I've been getting uh, emails and questions about or mentioning the fact that you talk about not worrying about grades and people have an issue with you talking about not worrying about grades. And I wanted you to expand here's my your thought okay. on it. Okay, class, are you ready? Here's the, here's the key. Re hang on, I'm going to do a close up uh, so you can, you can hear me. Listen. If I make adjustments to the syllabus right now, you'll stop doing anything, right? You, you, you won't go to any of your groups. If I tell you like, hey, don't worry, we're gonna, we're gonna let you make up as, as, as many world and conversation groups as you need to. If you need to make up pa pack backs, don't worry, we'll let you make up more than two. Um, yeah, we'll give you three absences if you need it. Whatever. If I make any adjustments like that, you, you, you'll stop doing anything. So I'm like, just keep going. We're going to make adjustments. It's going to get, you're going to, the vast majority of you are still going to get A's and we're going to make the adjustments, but I'm not telling you what the adjustments are right now because you'll just stop. Instead of like 700 people watching the stream, it'll be 20. It's like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. You, you, you won't do any of the readings for the quiz because you'll be like, yeah, okay, I don't have to do the readings for the quiz. No, no, no. Just keep going. I'm not going to tell you what adjustments we're making. It'll be a surprise. But what I want you to do is act as though we're not making any. Okay. Got it? So you, you see, this is the commons. This is it. So therefore, you all suffer because some of you are just going to be like, yeah, all right, good. Good to go. But, right? but, but at the same time, just add one thing. There, it's also, an because this is true about a lot of the decisions we're yep. making right now, yep. is that um, what's really important in an unstable time is a routine. Yeah. And there, and so we are committed to providing that kind of stability because, Hey, it would be cool for us to just hang out right now. Dude, I don't do any work, but <laughs> we aren't doing that because it really is important, um, to have an anchor. And so social 19, keep going. Like, like a lot don't of miss, don't miss your groups, do your pack backs, do what you gotta do. I got your back. Okay. We got, we got it. Right. Did I, am I, don't bring me in. On <laughs> hey, no, I do it. I'm not, I'm not just giving A's out, but I'm just like, don't stop. Just stop. Okay. Just stop. You understand if I give you an inch, you'll go like, Oh, okay. Therefore we'll take go. a mile. Did, hey, we also, have we have uh, Kennedy on uh, the stream here. If you wanted to come on to. No, hang on, hang on. K Kennedy's coming on. It is it, uh, going to be coming on next week. So, uh, yeah, All right. I got, I guess Kennedy's going to be part of a case study next week. So, and then one other yeah. question, just to finish up class, where do you get your sources on this stuff? 
Like all what on any, what stuff? Anything. Like where do you get your sources? <laughs> Delorey, should we tell him <laughs> my sources? My bond, sources? right? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't know where's where do I get my sources, man? My closet. I don't know. You mean like your whole, you know, my whole decades stick? Of, of studying? Like that? Is that what Wait, you mind 30, 35 years of thinking of... about this, right? Uh, maybe, maybe you can share some uh in some one of your communication people. Yeah, dude, this is this is like first off, I didn't give any numbers out that require any kind of uh that require any kind of source at all. I gave nothing. I gave a perspective. I gave a sociological perspective. So it doesn't there are no sources to be, be given. This is a, you know, a, a pattern way of thinking about what are really pretty fascinating issues. And again, trying to turn the lens so that, you know, like when you hear a word like taxes, I know that for me, for most of my life, I just turn off. I'm like, oh, I don't want to think about that. But now it's a sociological term. It's so interesting. It, everything is so fascinating to see in these ways. And so that that's what that's what I would say. And by the way, you should know, I'm very much a free market uh, economic thinker. And I continue to be registered as a libertarian. And here's why. This will be the last thing I say, and then we're going to go on. Because as a sociologist, I understand all the reasons why if I were running a society, I would have lots and lots and lots of rules because I would want to try to manage human behavior in ways that were really, really good for the public good, right? Beneficial for the public good. So I, I lean on creating lots and lots of rules. And so I read a lot of libertarian work, um, thinkers. Uh, I, I tend to uh, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a registered libertarian because I'm really involved in that community as a way to balance myself out. So then I come back over here and say, whoa, 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 hang on. This is all about, you got to balance out. You need individual freedom. You need liberty. You need individuals to do this. And so the two things then come together in this kind of balanced way. So, um, and then I can stay right in the middle, which is where we want the fulcrum to be. And I think Tuesday is going to be a really cool class, by the way. So look, you know where the quiz is. Can you not, if you're paying attention, please, I got to think that you, you're going to be able to find the quiz um, pretty easily. Um, I don't think we have anything else. Jeff, anything else? I think we're two minutes over. Podcast tomorrow, most likely. Oh, I don't know if we're doing a podcast tomorrow. We'll see. Yeah, maybe we will. I don't know if I talk to. Yeah, I, okay. We'll talk about it. We'll we'll announce that. Lori, do you have a final comment? No. Should I? No, nah, I don't know. Yeah, we're register to try out to be a facilitator. Yeah, dudes, come on, man. Can you can you do that? Uh, register to try out to be a facilitator. All right, jump on. Take the quiz. Um, be well. We'll see you all next week.